Hey everybody, people always ask me, Manny, what tools should I be using for my Amazon business? Well, this episode is brought to you by Helium10.com. These are the same tools I use to generate six figures per month with Amazon FBA. I get keyword research, product tracking, listing optimization, search term tracking, account monitoring, and a lot of other brand new money pulling tools that are gonna be released to Helium10 members on a regular basis. If you're gonna grab any tools, check these out. Seriously, get a massive advantage with the tools that top sellers are using right now. Okay, and they're all in one place. Some tools and services will have a user cap, so get in there as quickly as you can. That's helium10.com. H-E-L-I-U-M 10.com. Warning, the following podcast has been classified as insanely lucrative. Listener discretion is advised. We were number one for our primary keyword, and we were out of stock for about a month. And as soon as we came back into stock, we had the number one spot again right away. And the bestseller badge. Your attention, please. Please. please, 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 please. Listening to the AMPM podcast may cause recurring revenue streams and unfair unfair advantages over your competitors. Other side effects may include better wallets, fired bosses, and longer vacations. Listen at your own risk. Here's your host, seven-figure entrepreneur and online marketing madman, Manny Coates. Manny Coates. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AMPM podcast. My name is Manny Coates, and I will be your host, and this is the show where we discuss all things Amazon private label and how to generate recurring revenue streams 24 hours per day during the AM and the PM, hence the name of the show, AMPM podcast. Get it? As a matter of fact, being the Netflix whore that I am, I love Netflix. I was watching a documentary called Minimalism and it got me and my girl motivated. We went into the closets and started cleaning out everything that was in there. Man, we got rid of a lot of stuff. So many clothes that I haven't worn in years. And while I was dumping all that clothes and donating it, I was making money. How cool is that? Pretty cool, I think. In today's episode, we are interviewing Regis Friend Cassidy. And this guy is crushing it, everybody. $2.5 million in sales on Amazon last year alone. And we talk some pretty cool strategies, some tactics. And he does some things that are quite different than the way I've taught and the way I do things. And it just goes to show that, you know, you don't always have to do things the way everybody says you have to do it. He does it slightly different and he gets phenomenal results. So to find out exactly what those are, let's jump into that interview right now. Hello, everybody. I am here with Regis Friend Cassidy, and this guy is a 35 year old millionaire. I say millionaire because he's been selling (laughs) for about a year and a half. He's done 2.5 million in sales, so that's pretty impressive in a year and a half. And I've got notes here. Welcome to the show, Regis, by the way. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Manny. So, people are going to be asking, I just want to get this out of the way. Your monthly sales, I have here $150,000 during the off season, $250,000 per month while in season. Is that right? That's correct. That was last year. Yes. That was last year for 2016. Perfect. And then you're working Amazon full-time, but before the glitch, you said that your full-time is actually kind of almost like (laughs) part-time. Yeah. I was saying that I have um, three kids going on four, two annoying dogs at home. I work from home. We homeschool. So I have a lot of distractions. So I probably get maybe a good four hours, five hours a day. um, And that's about it. So (laughs) it's kind of part-time hours. Yeah, but that's the dream. That's what I think everybody wants is, you know what? If I can sell a quarter million dollars a month and work four hours a day, that's sweet. I definitely want to get there. So that's pretty cool. Tell everybody how you even got into the whole Amazon business. Yeah, so um, I had a day job about five years ago working at a national laboratory and um, pretty miserable there, even though it was a great place to work and, and um, great income. But uh, I just knew I was an entrepreneur at heart and I wanted to do something different, be my own boss and, um, ended up quitting just to kind of give myself some space to figure out what I was going to do. I didn't really have a plan going into, um, my, um, retirement. And, and, um, so anyways, I started doing web development and, um, and web design. And now one of my clients had me build him an e-commerce store about two years ago. And I've been hearing some good things about Amazon. And so I told him, well, you know what, I'll build this e-commerce website for you, but let's also put your products up on Amazon and see how it does. And, um, you know, it's really hard to drive traffic to e-commerce stores. It's really slow going, but his products on Amazon started selling after day one. So 
we were both floored by that. And uh, my client, this client was very excited about it. And he actually reached out to me and offered to, to partner up 50, 50 to run a private label business on Amazon. And uh, that's what we've been, what I've been doing since. Nice. So you have a partner right now, the same guy? Yes, correct. Okay, cool. And how many products are you guys currently inventorying? Yeah, so we probably have about eight or nine products. There's a few more SKUs than that because we do have some variations, you know, like color and stuff on some of those. But mm -hmm. um, about eight or nine, um, we, we do have more in the pipeline than that, even some that are actually even live on Amazon. But um, unfortunately, I just haven't gotten around to really um, promoting and launching yet. So yeah. How many brands make up those products? Two brands right now are really taking off and we're kind of going deep into those brands, but we really have four brands that we're sitting on right now. Okay. But two that you're focused on and you're expanding out essentially. Correct. Okay, cool. What category do you mind saying? No, we're in, um, we're in a few different ones. We're, you know, trying to spread out that way. So, you know, we're in sports and outdoor and that's why, you know, um, our monthly revenue is somewhat seasonal. Um, sports and outdoor obviously has a big boom in the spring and summer. Um, but we're in um, patio lawn and garden, we're in home and personal care, or recently just launched into baby. Um, so we're trying to hit them all eventually. <laughs> so your sales curve then essentially, is it because it's sports related and in the summer months, it's pretty solid. Do you not see the spike that a lot of people see during Christmas or do you still see that as well? Actually, I do. So this particular product in sports and outdoors is also a very popular uh, gift item. So we get a huge spike in the summer and a huge spike at Christmas. How much did you sell in December? Do you mind me asking? Yeah. So the last snapshot I took was actually from Thanksgiving day through the end of December. So just a little over that month, but we did over 400 K for that period. Nice. That brings a smile to your face when you see that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that, and that was actually um, stocking out on two of our top sellers. So, you know, we probably could have hit half a million or gone over it if we had managed to stay in stock. Yeah. Why did you run out of stock? Shame on you. I know, I know. <laughs> but did you actually sell more than you expected or was it a shipping issue? What was it? Yeah, it was selling more than we expected. So, um, you know, the tides are always changing on Amazon. And so we had actually stocked up too heavy on one item that was our top seller um, in Christmas 2015 and not enough on what kind of surprised us in 2016 as being our top sellers. So it's just always a juggling act. <laughs> it is. And, you know, and I'm just kidding around when I say shaming you because it's one of those things that just happens, but it happens, right? It happened to me too. And I was planning. I'm like, all right, I know this is going to be like a 3X, 4X month. And I still stock that as well. So, you know, things happen. I don't know what happened this Christmas. I was under the impression that with the increased amount of sellers that have come into Amazon since, you know, the previous December, which is when I actually started, that the sales volume would be, there'd be more people buying on Amazon, but it'd be spread over more sellers. So my volume would probably be similar, if not a little bit less, you know, in terms of conversion stuff, but it wasn't the case. It was more. I was very surprised. Yeah. And the, I mean, and that's awesome. And that's kind of what happened to us too, is, you know, we launched these products, you know, early 2016. And since then, uh, had, you know, had acquired a, a lot more competition, but, um, you know, we kind of remained the top dog through the Christmas season because of, um, having uh, better reviews, more reviews, and just overall better listings, in my opinion. Yeah, I now want to talk about that in just a minute. But first, I want to ask, how much money did you guys start with when you started this back in July? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so my business partner, he's, you know, he's kind of my sugar daddy. He's, the, he's a, an entrepreneur of many years and has you know, created and sold businesses um, before we partnered up. And um, so he did get us started. It was his capital that got us started. Um, you know, but we started out with a, you know, modest, you know, five to $10,000, I believe. Um, and then, you know, we did expand pretty quickly into, into new products that we would not have been able to do without his capital. Um, you know, but we did start out small. Our first order was only 500 units. 500. And did you express ship those out or were you guys already using freight forwarders to bring stuff in and by sea? No. In fact, that's one of our huge lesson learned uh, for 2016 is we did way too much air shipping. So when we first got started, we did air shipping and it wasn't too bad on our first product because it was so small. Um, but we continued to do um, air shipping just because we were having a hard time um, staying in stock. We were always having to rush orders and um, we just we lost a lot of money doing air shipping. <laughs> Yeah. I hate that. I hate it. You know what? Here's a little story and you can probably relate to this. I mean, do you do any sea shipping at all right now or is it still all express? That's what we're trying to exclusively do now is sea shipping. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I have a container that was full. It was ready to go. 
And because of Christmas and having stocked out, essentially, you know, I knew I was going to be running out. I was like, you know what? Pull like 1,200 units out of that container and express ship them out, you know? And so now I have like extra space in this container that I already paid for. So the cost of shipping container is essentially the same, but I'm paying an extra $6,000 in air freight to get these things out here. So it's, it's literally, it's painful, right? It's $6,000 out of your bank account, your pocket to pay for the shipping. Oh, I hate it. Yeah. I hate it. But you got it. You know, it's the alternative is running out of stock and then trying to, you know, you lose that momentum sometimes and trying to get back there takes a while, right? Yeah. And and we used to be really scared about that. And this may be the case with with some people and, and you know, with their products. But, you know, we, we have learned over this last year and a half that at least with the, with some of our products where we where we calm, what we often um, stock out on is it's actually really easy for us to get back at the top on page one. In fact, um, with this product we stocked out right before Christmas, we were number one for our primary keyword and we were out of stock for about a month. And as soon as we came back into stock, we had the number one spot again right away and the bestseller badge by the next day. So that was with nothing, no changes on your end, just essentially going into stock. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we didn't do fulfilled by merchant or anything. We just, you know, let it go out of stock and, um, yeah, just fortunate enough that when we came back in stock, we still maintained our rank. So so we don't panic as much now when we run out of stock, other than we know that we're, you know, we're losing out on those sales because we didn't manage inventory well. But at least we know that we're not going to have to start from scratch and rebuild rank and all that stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, there's so many strategies people talk about, you know, and I've taught them myself on the podcast is do this or do that. But if you've got enough Amazon history, I and mean, it sounds like you do with your ranking and stuff, then you can get that positioning back pretty quickly. Yeah, that's definitely the case, at least with, you know, um, one or two of our products that's you know, we have had a different story with one of our other products where we stocked that way back in um, December 2015. We were number one, we came back into stock sometime in the end of January. And, you know, we never really did regain our top position with that product. So I, get, I don't know. I don't know how it works. Amazon, you know, it's this huge black box and it's, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. From our chat, you know, our communications back and forth, you're not really big on, you know, doing these big launch giveaways or external traffic, that kind of stuff, right? Tell me how you guys built up this business of yours. Yeah, sure. So it's not that I'm not big on that. It's just that, um, you know, we didn't really need to do that. Um, you know, I had plans on doing all these, all these fancy things with external marketing and doing, you know, um, um, press releases and external Facebook, um, PPC and all this stuff. Um, but when it came down to it, um, you know, we did a small friends and family launch um, got about 10 initial reviews. And then it was just a matter of providing over the top customer service, um, after that. And, um, you know, I've always been able to get reviews from organic sales, uh, pretty easily. I mean, you know, 10% seems like a small number, but you know, in, in terms of converting a buyer into leaving a review, 10% is actually pretty high. I'm, I'm quite pleased with that number, but, um, that's, you know, we get anywhere between 10 and 12% on our products now. Just to clear up, this is if you send out a follow-up email to somebody who's bought, you get basically one out of 10 people will actually leave you a review? That's correct. Wow. I'm going to want to touch on that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So what are you doing essentially? You say you're getting friends and family. Are you still doing that for a current launch? Have you done something like in the last 90 days where you use that tactic? Um, not in the last 90 days. Um, I actually tried launching to our own internal list that we managed to build with one of our products. Um, and it didn't, it was not near as successful as launching to family and friends. Um, I, you know, I've been hearing some things in the Facebook groups that uh, Amazon was having some crazy ninja ways of knowing who your family and friends were, even if they lived in another state and you've never shipped anything to them. Um, and they're having their accounts suspended. So I was a little, I was a little nervous to do another friends and family launch. So I tried just marketing to a fairly modest sized list. We were late to the game and building an email list. So we had, I don't know, maybe 150, um, or no, it was more like, it was more like 200 people on our internal list for a product. And I tried launching a product to them. Um, but only got, only got about five or six reviews. I was pretty disappointed with that. Although I have been hearing too, that um, and that was with a coupon code. So, you know, they would have been on verified reviews, but I, but I have been hearing too, that Amazon has not been allowing a lot of reviews to go through. So I don't know if that may be the case or if, um, we simply didn't have people leave reviews like I thought they would, but, um, but going back to, you know, our original strategy where we would launch to family and friends, um, we would do that to get initial reviews, but, um, 
we would start getting organic sales on top of that. And I would actually start out by emailing those customers directly. I wasn't using automated um, email um, messages um, at the very beginning. Um, I wanted it to be very, um, very real. And I wanted to, to really try hard to, you know, to develop those relationships with our um, actual customers, not just our fam- friends and family, but actual customers. And so I would reach out to those people um, myself manually and let them know, you know, that we're new. This is a new product on Amazon and we want to make sure that they receive the product um, on time and in perfect condition. Um, and then I would say something like, and if you have an extra 30 seconds, um, please let me know why you you know, chose our product over all the other choices you had on Amazon. And um, people would reply to that email. So I wasn't asking for them to click a link and leave a review. I was just asking them to actually reply to me and they would, they would reply to that email um, with some positive feedback on the product. And then um, from there, you know, I I would just shoot, shoot them off another email and say, Hey, you know, that's great. I'm glad you are happy with your product. Oh, by the way, you know, we're a new company, small family run business, blah, 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 you know, all these templates that we've, that we've heard before. But um, you know, the thing that I make sure that I do is I copy and paste exactly what they wrote in their email reply to me and ask them to then just copy and paste that at a link that I give them to leave the review. And so that, and so, and so that's what I do to this day now. Um, and in a lot of our products, I've just been lazy and I haven't even set up those second and third emails to go out uh, just because I have such a high conversion rate on getting people to reply to me. And from there, if people are engaged with you one-on-one in email exchange, then, then that's when I find it's really easy to get them to leave a review. Absolutely. I've actually talked about that on the podcast as well. It sounds like we do exactly the same thing, which is, you know, the first email, don't ask them for anything. Just ask them what they think of your product. Get that engagement going because once they open up and you've got that communication going, they're probably like 20 times more likely to actually view that review. So you only do one email then, one email right now, that's it. For, yeah. In terms of automation. And then after that, you follow up manually. Yeah, exactly. And then just to kind of retouch on on a little subtle point that I made there before is, You know, a lot of us are used to receiving emails now on Amazon asking, like, how did you like the product? And so that's why I switched it up to ask them something different. And so I find that by asking them, you know, did you receive your product in time and in perfect condition from Amazon? It it changes it up enough to where I don't I guess, you know, people aren't so just desensitized to it. Right. Like they they feel like they're actually talking to a human being this time and not just responding to some automated email. Um, so I find that, um, I'm, you know, I get people to respond to that easily. And then since they're already taking the time to let me know about that, then they don't mind writing an extra sentence or two about how, you know, why they chose our product. So, yeah. Are your products, are they high priced items or would they fall? No, um, our products range anywhere between like 15 to uh, $40. I would say our average sell price is around 25, 26. So no, it's not high priced. Okay. You're doing quite a number. I mean, there's a lot of sales going through your account every single day then, right? I mean, generally speaking. Yes. So if you've got that many people going through, you know, that are purchasing and you've got, you know, all of these emails going out and you've got, you know, a very high conversion rate, do you have a VA or somebody that's handling, you know, the follow-ups or how do you get all this done in the number of hours that you have in a day? Yeah. Yeah. So I used to do this all myself and it, you know, it it came to that point where I was spending all my time on, on emails Um, and I had a hard time giving that up, but I, but I needed to, in order to to focus on some other things, but, you know, I actually receive a lot of joy in talking with my customers. And so it was really hard to give, give that part up. Um, but I had, um, created some systems, um, using, um, Gmail and some plugins for Gmail to kind of make my responses easier and fast. Um, I know there's a lot of like help desk software out there, like Zendesk, stuff like that, where you can do some of these things with, but um, I wanted something that I could customize very specifically to my needs. And I have a background in, in software development and I've always just kind of been a Frankenstein of software. So I love Gmail. I love how easy it is to search in there, um, which I, which is a feature I use all the time of Gmail is I'm always searching for conversations I've had with customers I use it to find customers, to segment customers, so that if we have a new product coming out, I can um, reach out to those customers again. Um, but anyway, so I kind of got everything down to a system and got all got all you know all these different plugins patched together the way I wanted. And then we did finally hire a VA in July, and um, because of because of how I had everything set up with templates and everything like that, um, she was able to take over really fast. Within a month, she was handling 95% of our email and she still does that um, today. So it's great. Nice. How many hours a day does she have to work to handle the volume? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, she, because my business partner is kind of the finance guy, so he always is the one to pay her. So I'm not sure what kind of hours she's reporting, but I believe it's between 15 and 20 hours a week. Is it a VA domestically or overseas? Stay at home mom here um, domestically. Um, that was another big thing that, that I wanted to do was to um, kind of support the lifestyle <laughs> that I wanted to live myself, you know? And so for me, this was all about being able to stay home with the kids. And so um, I'm all about finding employees that have kind of the same passion and goals in mind. So yeah, we our our VA is domestic and she's a stay at home mom with a new baby. And so I think that's awesome that we can, you know, support her like that. Yeah, man, that is awesome. What email follow-up system are you using now? I was using Feedback Genius. I'm still using it and it's still great, um, but I'm slowly transitioning my email templates over to Managed by Stats. Um, I've been bugging the developer of Managed by Stats for a while now to implement some features that Feedback Genius had. Um, so that I could fully switch over. Um, but yeah, that's what, that's what I'm using now. And it's primarily just to send off that first email, like I was saying. And then, and then it's all about actually engaging with the customer one-to-one, um, you know, using our Gmail and, and other things like that. Yeah. Why the switch from Feedback Genius to Managed by Stats? So Managed by Stats, um, first of all, I love the um, kind of the analytics inside of it. It has kind of a crude interface, but I love that it allows you to download, um, you know, an Excel format. Um, your analytics. And so, um, so I was using managed by stats anyways, for uh, tracking our analytics. Um, and then they've been, so the, the email component of managed by stats is called seller mail and they've slowly been adding really cool features to seller mail. And so um, you can have follow-up sequences that go out to people who request a refund, whether they, you know, it was their first time buying that you can unsubscribe people um, from just, an email sequence that pertains to that product, you can unsubscribe them from any future emails from you. And so there's just, there's a lot of flexibility there, which is um, important to me because, you know, my goal in anything that happens to be automated is to make it seem not automated. I want it to be as real as possible because I want to make the customer feel like they're talking to a person and not just automated software. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I was curious, you know, when people say, well, I switched from this to this. Why? Why did you say if it was working? So that's really cool you know, that you touched on those topics. And I think that having specific follow-ups for specific people, you know, maybe they bought a product a second time and you want to hit them a little bit differently than somebody who buys it the first time is that's kind of cool. So a lot of people focus when they're first starting out, they're focusing primarily on just the product selection. What are your thoughts on that? Where that's what they're doing as their main thing? Yeah. So, um, I kind of have a different take on product selection or at least, you know, a different perspective from what's worked for me. It's not that I disagree with anything that's being taught out there, but, um, you know, a kind of by accident, I discovered, um, that I actually have the most success when I find products that aren't going to pop up in some of these automated tools, you know, that help you find products with high demand. Um, you know, I take more of a stance on that rather than selecting a hot product, you should um, think about it more in terms of product development. And, and, and this kind of goes back again to just kind of my whole philosophy on everything that drives our success is the focus on customer service. So if you're focusing on the customer, that, that, that automatically should steer you towards products that actually are needed in the marketplace versus are just hot, you know, and that you're just wanting to, you know, take a piece of that pie. And so, um, you know, some of our top selling products right now, if you were to use Jungle Scout, um, back when we were first sourcing these products, um, if you were to use Jungle Scout, you would see that there was no depth to these products. You know, there may be one seller who was selling about, oh, I think um, for one product I'm thinking of particularly, I think the, the highest volume that the top seller was doing was around 10K a month. Everyone else, it was like, you know, just hundreds a month. And, um, but I actually saw an opportunity there because this product was part of a niche that I knew was exploding. And, and, and I could tell that the only reason why there wasn't more sales with this product is because no one had taken the time yet to develop it in a way that the customer actually wanted. Um, you know, there was a lot of things missing about it. No one was taking, um, taking care to develop the branding of it. Right. And so, um, I, you know, I, my, my business partner, when I told him, you know what, I think we should invest in this product. He wasn't quite sure. He's like, you sure about that? The top seller is only doing this much. I'm like, no, no, I really just kind of have a feeling this is going to do well. 
And uh, we launched that product in the first month and went live on Amazon. Um, we did over 60,000 in sales and stocked out. <laughs> nice. And so, um, so yeah. And, you know, looking back, you know, a lot of our products are like that, um, where, you know, I'm always thinking about how can we develop a product that better meets the needs of what the customers want. And I'm not talking about inventing stuff. We don't have patents on anything. Um, I'm just talking about taking something that is private label and then just making changes to it. So it's better. Give me an example. Like if somebody's listening to this right now, they're like, I, 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 what does he mean by that? Yeah, let's see. I'm, let me try to let me think of an example here that doesn't, you know, Give away your my pro- yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's always, that's always the trick, right? But um, I, is there a particular product that you use commonly as like your example? Like I know Scott Volker always talks about the garlic press. I don't, what do you use? <laughs> I don't. Yeah. You can pick whatever you want. I tend to, I guess I use tactical flashlights for a lot of my examples. I don't know why, but it's just what's something that I bring up. Pick anything you want. Yeah. Okay. Well, so like in the case of a tactical flashlight, you know, if, if you go on there and you do your, your product research about a t- tactical flashlight and, you know, you know, you have the mindset that, well, I'm just, I don't want to just add another tactical flashlight, same old, same old that's already on there that everyone else is selling. Um, let me see what really is wrong with this product and, and how I can make it better. You know, and it may have to do with the brightness. It may have to do with the durability. It may have to do with, um, you know, how it, you know, the weight of it and how it feels in your hand. Who, who knows? And you're getting these things from reading the reviews? Yeah, reviews. Um, yeah, you know, I use reviews a lot, reading negative reviews. Um, but sometimes, too, it's just using common sense and having a hunch. <laughs> um, you know, just if, if you see that, like, I, because, you know, something like a tactical flashlight already has a lot of demand, and you can see that on, on Amazon. So, like, you know, in my example, I was saying with our product, there wasn't actually high demand for it on Amazon yet. But, but it was related to a product that did have huge demand on Amazon. So I just knew something was missing. I'm like, well, if everyone is buying this product on Amazon, why aren't there more people buying this? And so to me, that revealed that there was just, there was a gap, you know, there was something missing about this product that people weren't going to Amazon to buy this product that paired well with this other one that was really popular. Um, And so I, you know, just, I just kind of, you know, it all goes back to, you know, the customer avatar, you know, thinking like who your ideal customer is and getting in their head and knowing what their frustrations are. And, um, you know, um, that, you know, that's what I did. And, and I've done that a couple of times now and it's really, you know, panned out well for us. Nice. Okay. So, and then when you're looking for new products, then now, since you say you're not really doing it the way a lot of people do, it doesn't matter to you then if there's no depth at all, if there's just one seller that's you know dominating that particular product or niche, you're good with that? Yeah, I, I mean, it depends, of course, on you know, on the circumstance and the product. But um, you know, if I see there's just one person dominating it, um, then yeah, I'm I'm totally willing to play king of the mountain with that person. It almost seems like you seek that out more so than where everybody has kind of I wouldn't say everybody, but where a lot of the popular guys that train say you know definitely don't do that. You're saying actually I like doing that. I like going after that, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, if especially if it's not like a big name brand that's like. You know, like I wouldn't try and go up against Apple or something like that. But it, but if if there if there is for like no apparent reason <laughs> on Amazon, um, you know that someone is dominating that market, and and you know you can do better, then by all means go after that, even if there isn't um, a lot of depth, because um, you know you can. I mean, it's it's kind of you know I I don't I don't really feel bad, but you know it is kind of sad to say at least that um, you know we have completely shut down some of our competitors' businesses that were there before us. But, you know, shame on them because, you know, they didn't take the time to make the product better. And that's, you know, kind of going back to, pro, to, to product development versus product selection. Product development is something that's constantly ongoing. So every time we re- reorder with our supplier, you know, I'm always looking for that one thing that we can change to make our product better. You know, that one extra feature we can add. Um, and, and we do that almost on every order with our products. Um, we're, wow. Are you sourcing from China? Yes. Okay. All right. So you said you're now bringing things in by the container? Correct, yes. Okay. We're going to talk about that on a different podcast. I'll have to have you come back on because we can go a little bit more higher level on some things. I definitely have some questions about that. So that's cool. So you modify the product. And I imagine these aren't like massive modifications or they don't require you to create molds and things like that. Or am I wrong on that? So far, we have avoided um, molds, although I have one product where that's what, it, what it's going to resort in. And, you know, and it's pretty, pretty expensive. 
Um, so we're still kind of deciding whether or not we're going to to make that jump with this product or not. But um, yeah, but you know, to date, it's just been it's been minor things, um, and sometimes it's just on the packaging too. Um, you know, it's it's not necessarily um, on on the product. Sometimes um, putting attention in the packaging has really helped us out too. Do you have any tips or strategies that you employ when you find a product and you go, okay, man, I don't understand why there aren't more sellers selling this? When you go out to actually seek a supplier for this, how do you do that? Is it just going out there and doing a lot of searches on Alibaba or do you have a, a specific tactic to use? Yeah, we've been pretty fortunate not having any nightmare stories um, with sourcing on Alibaba, but that's pretty much all we've used. And, you know, both me and my partner um, are kind of all about speed to market. Um, and, you know, we didn't really mess around with getting samples from, um, you know, five, 10 suppliers. Um, we kind of just, um, went with what felt right. And usually that was either the first or second supplier we reached out to. Um, I, um, some of the suppliers I could tell were already, were the manufacturer for some, for some of our competitors, um, which gave me some confidence. Um, right. Cause you can look at a competitor's history and their reviews to see if, if, um, you know, they're, if, if it's good quality or not. And so that definitely helps. Um, but you know, that's not something I've, I've really stressed about. Um, inspections is not something we've ever stressed about. We haven't had one single inspection. Um, now I say that, and, and, and it's important to know that we have had issues with defects. In fact, we've had issues with design flaws and with defects. Um, but again, just because when we first started out knowing that customer service was like, our primary focus that we were going to provide over the top customer service. And we've always been able to survive any of those issues with defects and design flaws by providing over the top customer service. And, and in a lot of ways, um, you know, it gives you the opportunity to really, really shine and, and be someone different as a seller or as, as a business that people aren't used to. If you can show humility, um, you know, it's kind of funny. We we had we had one product that really had issues, and I had sent not just a second replacement, but a third replacement. And this particular customer had received defects with all three, um, and that was that was really unheard of. It was it was a really unfortunate, unlucky. But you know, this person had already left a scathing one star review after the first defect. But by by the by the fourth you know product I sent this customer, they were they were. They were um, disassembling the product for me. They were taking photos. They were drawing diagrams on helping me um, to try and to troubleshoot this. And we, I ended up working with this customer to figure out what the problem was. And they were so impressed with that. And they were so happy to be able to participate in like fixing this issue that, um, you know, they ended up changing their one star to five stars. And, um, you know, it's, so it's just really cool when when you can kind of build those relationships with your customers and you don't have to worry so much about all this other stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Is it safe to assume then that you were not asking the customers to contact Amazon to get a replacement sent out? You were manually sending these things out to them? Yeah, never. In fact, um, sometimes it, it kills me when I'm in these Facebook groups and people say, you know, hey, I got a one star review because the customer never received their product. What should I what should I do? And, and you hear the people in there say, tell them to contact Amazon. You know, that's what we're paying Amazon for. Um, you know, if there's any issues with the product being broken or lost, you know, they have them reach out to Amazon. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> this is a, this is a perfect time where you can go above and beyond and knock the socks off this customer. And so like, you know, in, you know, at Christmas time, there's, there's always issues with shipping stuff getting lost in the mail, especially if stuff is going USPS. And, um, you know, I, I, I love when these problems actually arise because it gives me, uh, gives me the opportunity to really um, shine and get some really great five-star reviews from our customers. And so, you know, if, if someone says that their package was never delivered, um, I let them know that um, because they don't always understand that Amazon is responsible for fulfilling our product. Sometimes they really do think you as the seller are packaging it up and shipping it from your warehouse. I let them know um, with a statement like, um, you know, even though Amazon is 100% 100% responsible for the fulfillment of your product, it was our business decision, you know, to use Amazon to fulfill your product. Therefore, we take full responsibility, and and I'm going to send you out a new product, and I'll ship it to them, um, you know, with uh, fast shipping, two day shipping, and everything. Um, so, and you know, it, a lot of people do giveaways to get reviews. I kind of do it 
backwards where I'd first try and get an organic sale, but I'm, but I don't hesitate to do a giveaway to an existing customer. And I seem to get reviews even faster that way. Yeah. And one of the things you're doing also is you're helping your metrics. And I think a lot of people in these groups you're talking about don't get that. They're like, we're paying Amazon. Amazon's going to send out a new version of this product. I won't get charged all the fees that I normally do. So it's cheaper than if I send out a product. That gets dinged on your account. You know, if somebody has a product that's malfunctioned and they're getting either a refund or replacement, it affects your metrics. So when you actually go out and proactively are handling this customer support, right? You're making sure that they're getting stuff and it never gets recorded on Amazon's side. You're looking good. And better metrics means better sales, better ranking. I mean, so many people have correlated that data. So I'm with you on that 100%. We weren't doing this for the longest time last year. And then we just started doing it not that long ago, actually. It was getting overwhelming. It was just me. I was kind of like in your boat. Like I needed to hire people. Once I hired people, yeah, the refund rates and everything, the metrics anyways, are just, they're almost non-existent. It's crazy. So, but let me go back real quick. You said that you sent out one email, you get this crazy response rate. What's your best subject line? <laughs> you know what? I have never split test that. And I have a really boring subject line, um, but I still seem to get around 50% open rates. And so um, I, I simply put RE colon, you know, for the, um, you know, the, the reply symbol you would expect to see if someone was replying to an email. But then I just say, um, Regarding your recent purchase of the product, you know, name by business name, dot, dot, dot. That's all I do on all of my emails. Really? Wow. That would be so counterintuitive to what I would think you would use. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think my logic for when I first created that subject line was just like, I wanted them to think, oh, there's an important email regarding their recent purchase about this product. You know, maybe it has to do with the shipping. If, 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 if they're receiving the email before they actually have the product or maybe it has to do with a recall. I don't know, whatever. Um, that was just kind of my logic for creating that subject line, but um, I don't know. I've never, I've never played with that, and I and I probably should. There's a, there's a lot I should play with, um, but um, for whatever reason, you know, I still seem to get really good open rates. So it's just not hasn't been a top priority. Okay, interesting, very interesting actually. <laughs> so looking back at 2016, do you see profit holes, gaps, places where you've left money on the table? Oh, tons. <laughs> Yeah. Just tell me about them. Let's talk about that. Uh, and, and, and I know it's probably upsetting to people to hear, to hear, you know, hear me complain about how much money I lost when, you know, we did, you know, over 2 million in sales in 2016. Um, but, but there's a ton. Um, but it, you know, it was our first full year of selling. So it's okay. They're, they're good lessons learned. And we definitely want to go into 2017 better prepared. But, you know, the first thing was the air shipping. Um, we just did not have a handle on, um, on our inventory and we were running out too fast. And so we were constantly air shipping and that was just costing us a ton. Um, the other thing was, well, just running out of stock. Um, you know, we would, it turns out a lot of our products ended up being good gifts. Um, and we weren't necessarily anticipating that. So we were running out of stock at mother's day, running out of stock at, um, at Christmas. Um, one of our very seasonal item and items, we ran out of stock in the middle of uh, summer. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we just, just inventory management, is something we have to have a better grasp on. Um, let's see what else, uh, we did have, uh, storage. Uh, we definitely, after seeing our storage fees for November and December, um, we spent over $21,000 on storage fees to Amazon. Um, we definitely have plans in 2017 to be doing more offsite storage, um, and just sending inventory in from, a from a, from a warehouse in California, like a month's inventory at a time to Amazon because the, the storage fees are, are, are really high there. Yeah. Have you found a good company? We're looking into that as well. We do have one, but I couldn't tell you the name of it. Um, I, that's something my business partner handled, so I'm not really sure at this time what, what it is, but I can let you know in a couple months um, how we like them. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I'd love to find out more information on any of this stuff. Yeah. Let's see. Um, one other kind of just money left on the table was um, we actually went to China in May. We met some of our existing suppliers and that was really good, really beneficial. Um, but we had sourced a few new products, um, came back from China um, because we had we used a we used a, a sourcing agent to, to get all those products together and send them over all at the same time. We didn't get those products until two months after our trip to China. and. Um, I, we didn't have good systems in place to to quickly launch those. And so we sourced these new products um, mid-year. And, you know, to be honest, we just we haven't properly launched them. So that's money left on the table. 
um, is not taking advantage of those new products we sourced. And so I'm kind of still kicking myself for that one. Just, you know, part of it is just not having also the resources. Um, you know, we definitely need to hire more help um, for, for launching products. Yeah. You have a sourcing agent in China that basically collects all of the products from different factories, puts them all into one shipment and gets them out here? Is that what you're doing? We, we tried that. <laughs> With our with our trip to China, that's that's what we did for that case. All of our other products um, that we had already established and are doing well with, those are those are um, with uh, manufacturers that we have relationships with that we established ourselves. And so I actually didn't like using the sourcing agent. I don't like not being able to communicate with with someone at the factory. So uh, I'm not sure we're going to do that again. Okay, you said uh, trip to China was beneficial. In what ways? First of all, we met a couple of our suppliers. Um, and so we met one of the suppliers where we were, we had a design flaw with our product. And so it was really good to sit down at a table and, 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 and talk about that. Um, you know, I think, you know, networking, seeing you face to face and, and, and establishing a relationship with your supplier is very important in the Chinese culture. They really respect that. Um, you know, we have plans of going out there again, maybe in a year or so, and to negotiate, you know, better terms, things like that, um, because, you know, they are going to be willing to give you a lot better prices if you're over there in China and not, and, and not you know, asking over here on stateside through, you know, through a computer for prices. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we went to, we went to Iwu and, and shopped the big market there. And, you know, that, that place is amazing. There's a ton of products. Um, we were, we were not very well organized the first time out there. We wasted a lot of time, um, just kind of learning the ropes the first day or two. So, um, but we did manage to come back with a few products sourced. Um, but like I said, our, our issue then when we came back was not having good systems and a strategy in place to effectively launch those. So, um, you know, it's my goal early in this early in 2017 to, to launch those products properly. Yeah. What are your financial goals in 2017? Uh, well, I'm always bad at goal setting. Um, but you know, I was thinking we did, you know, we did a little over 2 million this year. I was thinking doubling that would be pretty awesome yeah. for 2017. We're going to at least have double the products, if not more. Um, so that should be doable. <laughs> um, but then you, you know, had your post in Facebook and you said your goal was three X. So I was like, well, why not? Let's go for three. X. <laughs> yeah. Three X I think is the top end. I think two X to three X is reasonable. I think two X is reasonable. Three X is kind of like the long shot. I'm hoping we'll see. It requires a lot of outsourcing. That's for sure. I was going to say, I can tell you to make that work is I'm going to have to, you know, release that control that I like having and, and really um, work on, on, on building a team. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. You're always learning. You're in the groups. You're reading stuff. In the past three months or so, roughly, related to Amazon or private labeling, what's something that you've learned and you've liked that you've started to implement or you're going to be implementing? In the last three months. Something recent. Yeah, it doesn't have to be three months, but something that's pretty recent. Well, I wouldn't say necessarily learn this. This is something that has been bugging me for a long time, and then that's the whole multi-channel thing, right? So, so far today, you know, all of our success has come from just being strictly on Amazon. And, that, and you know, that has always made me nervous, especially with, you know, the new policies Amazon's um, implementing, and they seem to just suspend count accounts willy-nilly. Um, and this is my sole source of income. And so that makes me nervous. And, and, um, also to one of our, one of our products, our top seller product for most of 2016 has been slowly dying due to competition and prices being driven down. Um, and I, I am fully confident that if we build that brand back up outside of Amazon, um, that we will reclaim, you know, our, our position in the marketplace there on Amazon. And so um, we've been investing in a really great e-commerce store and social media. And so I'm excited to, to launch that here in the next, next month um, and to see what that, what that can do for us. Yeah, that'll be cool. Keep me posted. I'd love to know. Which is kind of funny because that's what I did before I did Amazon is I did e-commerce stores and, and things like that. But, um, you know, I guess I was all too happy to kind of move away from that because it's so much work uh, to just focus on Amazon. But now I'm having to come full circle and get back into doing that. But um, this time around, you know, I'm, I am outsourcing it. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. So are there any products that you would not want to sell based on what you know, any niches or categories or anything at all? Well, it's not specific to a category, but um, you know, I, I go to these conferences and I hear, I hear a lot of people's struggles and you know, I don't really have, I don't know how to tell them this, but, um, you know, to their face, but 
really what I find to be a big problem is just that lack of innovation on products, right? And they're thinking more of, again, it's just products. It's just product selection. How do I select a product that has high demand? And they're not really thinking, they're not coming from the perspective of a customer. You know, we really should be asking, how do I select a product that a customer needs and doesn't have access to yet? Um, you know, for example, um, you know, the world doesn't need another private label brand of peppermint essential oil, but because it's so hot and such a top seller on Amazon, so many people are attracted to it. But in, you know, unless you're going to be a company that goes and sources peppermint oil from some new remote area where the therapeutic benefit of this oil is, you know, for some reason greater than everyone else's on Amazon, then, I, you know, I really would suggest you stay away from just adding more products that the world doesn't need, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. find those gaps in the market um, that customers are asking for and don't have access to yet, and then provide that over the top customer service. And then, you know, that's, that's to me, the easiest way to succeed on Amazon. Now you can always just find, you know, another iPhone case and use all these crazy tactics and various things to get ranked on page one and Amazon and be successful that way too. It's, it's, it's but it's a different way of doing it. And it, it requires a different skill set and different personality. And I think a lot of people um, struggle with that strategy. Um, so, you know, I like to propose to people just take a step back and let's think about a different strategy and, and, and think about how you can serve someone, how you can serve the market and not just be trying to grab a piece of the pie of something that's already hot on Amazon. Yeah. Well said, well said. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. So, you know, you're doing 2.5 million per month, guys. This guy knows what he's talking about. Nuggets in here. I hope you've been taking notes for you. Just, if anybody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way of doing so? Uh, yeah, sure. They can um, email me at uh, my first initial R, my last name, friend Cassidy at gmail.com. I'd be happy to, to talk to anybody. Wow, you're brave giving out your email on a podcast with <laughs> <laughs> this many people. <laughs> okay, good. You're also in our group though, right? Yes, I'm, I'm also in the group there. Yep. Okay, cool. So if you guys want to reach out to them, you know, instead of emailing them, do that as a last resort, but uh, reach out to them <laughs> in our Facebook group. It's the FBA High Rollers. And if you want to get there, guys, you can go to our website at ampmpodcast.com forward slash Facebook, or you can just go to Facebook and type in FBA High Rollers and you'll see us. But Regis, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been awesome, man. Hey guys, if you like this episode, definitely check out episode number 100. I interviewed Jeff Nelson and he went from zero to $200,000 per month selling on Amazon. And he does things differently, right? He sells oversized products. He has his own warehouse. It's an awesome interview. Check it out. Episode number 100. Hey guys, Manny Coates here. If you've been following my podcast, you know I'm a huge fan of the Helium 10 tools for Amazon sellers. I only use the best tools out there and the Helium 10 suite of tools are in my opinion, best in class. Now, just because I'm the founder of Helium 10 doesn't mean that's all I use, right? I go where the money's at and if there's a tool on the market that I haven't made and that tool helps me make money, I'll use it and I'll talk about it here on the podcast and I'll even link to it in our tools section at the ampmpodcast.com website. But I can honestly say that there's no place that I know of where you can get all the important tools that an FBA seller would need in one place, where the tools work with one another to help you save time and make you a lot of money. Now, the Helium 10 tools have had a huge hand in helping me go from zero to over a million dollars in Amazon sales in just 10 months. Okay, keyword research, listing optimization, and a super tool called 5K Checker that makes sure that the words in my listings, okay, the front end and the back end, are actually indexed by Amazon. And guys, if you're not checking this, you're leaving money on the table for sure because Amazon is always tweaking their search engine. Okay, so I always use 5K Checker every single month on every single one of my listings to ensure that my listings are still indexed for my keywords and that I'm still pulling in customers like crazy. If you're a longtime listener, you know I'll never use a tool unless it can save me a lot of time or it's going to make me a lot of money. So I'm confident Helium 10 will do this for you guys. All right. There's a money back guarantee, so there's no risk. Check it out. Head over to Helium10.com. Helium10.com. That's H E L I U M 10.com. You've been listening to the AM PM podcast hosted by Manny Coates. For more information, insider, insider tools, tools, and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit ampmpodcast.com.